I need a nap just from watching that. I'm tired. You know, it's amazing is that literally is just a taste of everything that goes on. I mean, just a touch of things that go on around here. It's a, a great place, and I'm just so thankful. Today is celebration weekend, and I this is just a chance for me to say thank you to all of you who give so much, and, and I'll tell you why in just a minute, but um, who besides me has the Publix Pilgrims? Anybody? These are my people here. Thank you. I, uh, I am so spoiled. A couple of years ago, I broke a bunch of them, like shattered, like dropped them off a table, and I took a picture and posted it on Facebook and said, they're all gone, or something. And the next thing I know, I had pilgrims and platters flying at me. So now I have like tons of pilgrims and platters, and this is actually the chipped one that fell. I kept him. So I have two sets. They talk to each other at night. <laughs> they don't? Mine do. Yours don't talk to you? I don't like him either. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> anyway, you know, when we think, I love Thanksgiving. Do you love Thanksgiving? I love Thanksgiving. And really, I, I'll be honest, I like Thanksgiving more than Christmas. I hate to say that out loud as a pastor, um, but I really do because it's a, a simple celebration together. We're there to give thanks. Oh, Margaret Bentley, uh, I'm supposed to tell you from YouTube, your cousin Ruth Williams said to tell you hi. She's watching online today. So I just wanted to make sure, got that out there. Anybody else want to say hi to a cousin or just making sure? She's online right now going, oh, yeah, anyway, so... Oh, I'm in so much trouble. So, you know, this is a reminder of, you know, I taught history for a while. Some of you don't know that. I taught school. And um, uh, one of the things that we talked about was, I, I think that year, the year that we celebrate the Thanksgiving with the Native Americans and the pilgrims together, I, I believe the pilgrims had lost a third of their families that year. And let me tell you what Thanksgiving is about for us. Thanksgiving is not about everything going great. It's not about you being past all of your problems. It's not about the next thing that's coming up that I know you're worried about or that cousin. I know that cousin, right? It's, I saw the two cousins this morning, the C-squared. That was awesome. All I could think was, oh, no. We all have that, but the truth is, in the middle of all of that, we have God's blessings. And so today, I just want to remind you of that, and this week, we're going to celebrate all that God has done. Um, I love the operation. The, the boxes just keep coming in. There's more piled up back there. We'll try to give you a number next week near the end of the service. We're going to pray over these boxes. And, um, but today, we're going to talk about three reasons to celebrate, and we're going to continue in 1 Timothy. And... Um, let me ask you a question. Especially in a full morning like this, I had no idea we'd be this full. I'm, I'm so thankful for those of you who parked in the grass, those who parked across the street today to make room. Thank you for making room. And here's what I want to say to you, okay? And this is very personal. Um, if, if you ever get me fired up, it's probably about one of these things. Um, get me excited about stuff. You making room for others, do you realize that making room for someone may change their life. When my mom was a young teenager, she had come to Christ when she was young from, some, from a couple that would take her and her sister, I know that's not proper English, but would take them to church, walk them to church in their neighborhood, but her parents wouldn't go, and my grandfather was an alcoholic, a working alcoholic, but an alcoholic nonetheless, sometimes abusive, sometimes not. And so every week, my Mom and her sister would beg my grandfather to go to church. And finally, they talked my grandfather and my grandmother into going to church. So when they got there, they wanted to sit as close as they could. They were hoping it would rub off on grandpa, maybe. So they sat right near the front, right up front, like second row. They were so excited. My mom was excited. Church was pretty full that day. 
a family came and sat behind my grandfather, and they were not able to listen to the pastor because the whole time the couple behind them said over and over, I can't believe you sat in our seats. I can't believe you sat in our seats. My mother, at 89 years old, still gets upset about whoever that was. Now, the good news is, years later, my grandfather did come to Christ, but it was years later. But what is it in us that thinks that somehow God blesses a selfish, self-centered life? The truth is, if we're going to be blessed, it requires sacrifice. If we're going to be blessed, it means we have to go out of our way. If we're going to be blessed, it means we have to be uncomfortable and even give up my chair for somebody who's been praying for their relative, for their neighbor, for their kids, in my mom's case, for her alcoholic father to come to know him. And because people being selfish and self-centered, my grandfather could not even listen to the message that day and would never go back to church again. So you don't know. You don't know what yourself, you going out of the way, what difference you're going to make, and if you're selfish and self-centered, what difference that will make. But every Sunday when I show up early in the morning, I love it because I come and people have already started parking in the grass. They don't have to park in the grass. They can park right in front of the door. They could get the best seats in the building. And one of the best things I love is when somebody comes to me after church that's visiting and says to me, Eric, I know that God, we're visiting today, and I know God wanted us here today. And I think, well, really? Well, well tell me how. Because the front parking space was open. And I don't want to tell them that's because of someone unselfish got out of the way. But what I tell them instead is, yes, he did. <laughs> and the truth is that you can be God's hands and feet when you go out of your way to bless people. By the way, I know when the kids sit here, they're in your way. I, I, no, 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 it's okay. They're in your way. They take up seats. They're in your way. And it's the best in your way it could be. And... and Somebody said to me, Eric, you know, isn't that going to be hard on you to start another service? And I said, no, because they're doubling my salary. <laughs> and just the fact that you laugh means you know the truth <laughs> about that statement. <laughs> the truth is, when we do anything to serve other people, it's inconvenient. When we do anything to serve other people, they get in our way. But we have to remember that Jesus went out of his way for us. And so that's what Thanksgiving's about, and that's what celebration. I, I, I'm so, I can't even tell you how grateful I am for you as a church. I, I, this is a shocker to you. Marianne knows me pretty well. I'm like this all the time. You should pray for my wife all the time. By the way, honey, raise your hand. She's right over here, so she... She, yeah. <laughs> doctor, doctor. Sorry, now I lost my play, train of thought. I looked at my wife. She's so pretty. I got distracted. He told me to say it. Just kidding. All right, here's the three reasons to celebrate. Number one. God values thankfulness. And let me tell you something about thankfulness too, just on a personal note. If you're struggling with discouragement, if you woke up and you, you ever just wake up grumpy? I'm not talking about your spouse. You ever just wake up and you feel grumpy? You just, I mean, for no reason, you just woke up and you're thinking of negative things and you're, the world is falling apart, whatever you're thinking about, okay? Whatever the news had the night before that you, okay? Whatever it is. Or that cousin. <laughs> or brother-in-law. Whatever you're thinking of, listen. When you begin to change that into being thankful, it changes you 
It changes how you respond. If you want to respond to people more appropriately, be thankful. If you want to respond to them the wrong way, get ungrateful and irritated and aggravated. I'm a good example of that one too, by the way, just so you know. Paul says this, 1 Timothy, he's talking to Timothy, he says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for people you like. No, for all people. For kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives, which I love that, this essentially means that they would leave us alone. That, that those in authority, the politicians, would just leave us alone. That's what he's saying. And then he continues, in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And then I love what Paul says here. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald. And I love that translation. It's what it means. Herald means to speak for the king. And some of you today need to realize that God has given you the ability to speak for the king. You are the example of others. I remember working at a restaurant and when a group from church would come in, the waitresses would look at that group and these were unchurched waitresses and they would say, that's a good church. Now they had never been to that church. But when that church walked in, they said, that's a good church. Why? Because of how they treated them. They were a herald. You've heard the song, Hark the Herald, Herald, right? They're they're announcing. And so that's what our job is. As an apostle, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. I'm a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. I love our church, believe it or not, began in September of 2011. Do you know why I know that? Because every time I have to call the insurance company, that's our secret question. I'm like, you realize that's public record, right? You're asking me, it'd be like, what's your middle name? I'm like, you can look that up. Somehow you're going to give me top secret information that you're not going to pay this bill when I let you know. So September of 2011, it started in a living room. Is there anybody in here that was in that living room with us? I see a few, three. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And so God started us that way. And then last week, I'm in a hospital room with two young boys. They're in their mid-20s, visiting with their mom who's not doing well. And I said to the boys, hey, I'm, I'm Pastor Eric. They go, oh, we know. Oh, no. Here's what they said. You ready for this? They didn't say, you're awesome. They didn't say, we've heard you speak. They didn't say, you know, we came to know Jesus. Nothing like it. You know what they said to me? They said, that's right. You're at the church with the best donuts. (laughs) Now, can I tell you something? I have yet to buy a donut and bring it to church. Because other people over the years have sacrificed and gone out of their way. The first thing that these young men say to me about our church is, you fed us good stuff. See, that's what we don't realize. We think, why do we do these things? And what we don't realize sometimes is these things that we do. And you may not even like donuts. I know, what's wrong with you? That's all I'm thinking (laughs) But, but, we, but, but here's the truth. Even if you don't, the truth is we don't do it for us. We do it because of young men like this who maybe don't go to church or haven't been to church in a long time who all of a sudden go, let's go to the church with the donuts. And their children say, let's go to the church that has the donuts. Let's go to a place where we feel accepted and loved and cared about. That's where people want to go. They want to go where when you sit in a chair, nobody sits behind you and goes, I can't believe they're in my seat. I'm so thankful for all of our leaders, all of our teams. I want to read a few of them this morning. Our staff, Mike Williams, who's worked with me now 20-something years, is back here. If you've never met Mike, he's back here in the corner. (laughs) Diane Green is administrative assistant or queen of the universe. You call her whichever one. 
Jill Spolstra is next door with the kids' ministry, but Randy's here, so you can clap for her. <laughs> Danielle will be taking over the children's ministry next year because Randy's got twins on the way. So, I mean, Jill does too, but she's not in here. Tracy Risley runs our youth group. She's not in here this morning, but she's here last night. And Joe and Danielle will be taking that over. Let me read a few of the teams. There are 34 that we could remember. And if I forgot your team and you're a team leader, come to me after church because here's the deal. I did it on purpose to see if you were a servant. Okay, it's an absolute lie. It means we forgot. All right. Number one, the A-team, Steve McCrory. Number two, street cleanup, Steve and Patty. The men's breakfast, Mark Bumgardner, who decided to move. We're going to pray for him. Number four, the blood mobile, Rick Zubowitz right here. Praise team, Denise Lesby over here. The greeting and usher team, Bob and Mary Ware. We're going to, by the way, we'll recognize all these people tonight at 6 o'clock at our dinner. And um, by the way, we call it a banquet. It's pizza and salad. So that's a stretch of the word banquet, but it works. Operation Christmas Child, the shoe boxes, that's Diana Knapp. She's here this morning. Faith Stories with the infamous Rodney Phillips, who's back there somewhere. Sunday morning announcement liner upper is Suzanne Robison, right here. Robison. I pronounced your name wrong for all these years. Saturday announcements of the deacons and greetings ushers is Marianne Alderman, who's not here this morning. Kitchen Hospitality is now Gary McNutt. He's the donut guy now. Of course, I went and told him that story first thing this morning. Where was I? Children, Jill, and soon Danielle will be in charge of that. I already announced that. Youth, Tracy Risley, Joe, and Danielle will be taking that over. Prayer ministry, Diane Green. <laughs> Senior lunch, Mike Williams. <laughs> Ladies lunch, Beth Warner, who's not here this morning. Ladies Bible study ministry, Amy Sue Lovis. Uh, Bob and Mary Ware have a small group. Surf Awakening is Beth and Keith Fields. Presentation team is Amy Sue Lovis. Sound lighting video, Randy Spolstra. Yeah, you better be excited about that or he'll turn off the mic. I do a Sunday morning Bible study and a Sunday night small group. Thursday Bible study, that's my mom and I. That's the pastor and mom. Somebody thought that was a Bible study for moms. Okay. I'm good with that. Uh, mission trip, Peggy Army. <laughs> Carrying cars to senior homes, Jane McGrady. You may not know about this one. One of our stay-at-home ladies, Patricia Walker, does our birthday cards to seniors. Um, Jill, and Diane, Jill and Diane do our supplies for the schools every year. Um, we also do supplies for Sharing Center. That's Patty Ritter and Diane Green. And then Fall Festival's Diane Green, and we threw Tracy Risley under the bus for that one. Uh, Hanging of the Greens, which is next week, even though Diane's last name is Green, Hanging of the Greens means we're putting things on the wall. That's next week, because believe it or not, Thanksgiving is only like, what, 10, 11 days away now? What in the world? Christmas Eve snow, Steve and Patty, did you know we do that every year? Information table, Mike Williams, I already said that, and then BBS team. Tracy Risley, that is the 34 teams that we have here. You didn't even know that. Now, let me read Colossians 4, 2 to you. It says this, devote yourselves to prayer, and then listen to this, being watchful and thankful. Now, watchfulness here has a couple of meanings. Number one, pay attention to what's around you, but it can also mean pay attention to what's around you, which means... Is there a need near you? The only Jesus that some people are going to see is when you're being watchful, when you're paying attention, when you look for needs and say, how can I help? So let me ask you this. When is the last time you prayed, God, use me, and then you were watchful? God, I want you to use me. Show me what I need to do, how I can help. Number two, worship refocuses our priorities. When I first I was a youth pastor for years. I loved being a youth pastor. So much fun. I, I had a great time. Anybody who's in my youth group knows. I just, that was just great for me. 
And I was out playing golf with Harold Brantley one day, and he said, have you ever thought about being a pastor? And I said, no. And he said, there's this church that can't pay you, but you should go there. And I went, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> and I went home that night, and the next morning when I was in prayer, I felt like the Lord said, it's time for you to be a pastor. And that was when I pastored the first church. It was because I took time out to put aside the needs of the world and say, God, what do you want me to do? For some of us, we get so busy with life and just trying to make it through that we haven't taken time to worship. Listen to this verse. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting holy hands without anger and disputing. By the way, one of the things this represents, if you saw me in public doing this, what would you think? Surrender. Surrender. Yeah, you've been arrested. Yeah, that's another way. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> he knows me too well. I didn't see it. I didn't see the speed limit sign. I'm sorry. Right? And so, and so it means surrender. And so when you raise your hands in worship, and you don't, if, you don't, if you do it at church, that's great. But even in your prayer closet, even in your car, just one hand, one hand, please, in your car. But, but raise your hand in worship as a way of surrendering. And then it says, I want the women, and then he says this, and I'm going to give you some background. I want the women to dress modesty with decency, propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pures or expensive clothes, but with good deeds. Appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Paul isn't saying not to dress up. He's saying, don't make it a distraction. Don't make that your focus. Make your goal to be the things you do, the things that you go out of your way for, not just taking care of you, but looking to be a blessing. There's another verse that I have hanging on the wall where, where my girls uh, 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 get dressed near their rooms. It's 1 Peter 3.3. 3. It says, your beauty shouldn't come from outward adornment, and then it goes on, and then it says, rather it should be that of inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. I know we dress the outside, but let's make sure we look at the heart that we take time to worship and say, God, I surrender this to you. John 4, 23, Jesus said this, a time is coming, has now come, where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, worship is not just emotion. It can be emotional, but it's not to focus on emotional. Just, just because you like a song and it makes you feel good doesn't mean you're in worship. Worship is surrender. So let me just give you some practical things that you can surrender. What are you worried about? If you want to worship, you take that to God and you go, God, you know I'm worried about. God, you know I'm frustrated by. God, you know I'm dealing with. And you surrender that to God. That is an act of worship. When you do that, you are worshiping in spirit and truth. Number three, godly leaders are a blessing. Do you know anybody who's gone out of their way to make you feel loved and cared about? Somebody who's gone out of their way to show you the love of Christ? Somebody who's gone out of their way to be a blessing to people? They're getting ready to build 300 more apartments, and I posted that because I was excited, and people who lived in this neighborhood went, ooh, they're ruining our neighborhood! And I went, yeah, but more people in heaven. I win. I get it. But the truth is, I'm thinking about somebody who's going to move in with their little kids, whose grandparents have been praying for those little kids and have been saying, God, would you help my grandkids to find out who Jesus is? Because my kids have been running from you. And my hope is that one Sunday morning, as we go to a second service, because we have to, well, we don't have to, but we need to, we go to a second service and somebody says, you know what, let's try that church across the street. And they come with their little kids and their little kids sit up here. And they get a bulletin on the way in and they say, wow, that church has donuts. Those people are crazy. <laughs> and the husband says, yeah, yeah, but they got coffee. You should taste it. And he actually stays awake because we caffeinated him. And the kids go next door and they come out and they say, it was awesome. We had people who cared about us, told us about what God said. Have you ever heard this verse, Dad? 
Dad, today we talked about Jesus and we talked about this story. Do you know that one? Dad, could you read me some stories about Jesus? And one day those same kids are calling Grandma back and saying, Grandma, we're going to church now. And Grandma's looking up to heaven and going, Thank you, Jesus, that you're answering my prayers. And we get to be a part of that. Not because of the pastor. Trust me, when I go to the hospital, they don't remember me. They remember the donut. <laughs> they remember you guys going out of your way to make room. They remember getting a front parking space. They remember finding a place to sit because you moved. You went out of the way. They remember that nobody sat behind them and said, I can't believe they're in my seat. And they come to Christ for eternity. And one day we sit in heaven across from them. And they say, I'm here because you went out of your way to be unselfish, to serve. Godly leaders are a blessing. And I'm thankful for all of you. All of you who do God's will. Paul continues, in the same way deacons, which is the word for servants, are to be worthy of respect. Sincere, which means just be yourself. Not indulging in much wine. Why? Because if you come to church drunk, it's going to be a problem. Not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths in favor with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and if there's nothing against them, let them serve. Let them serve and be an example to others, be an encouragement to others. In Hebrews 13, it says this, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Don't forget to do good and to share with others, for such sacrifices God is pleased have confidence in your leaders. Submit to their authorities because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. This is how I feel about our church. It is a joy for me to be here. Not because of me. It's a joy for me to be here because of you. Because of the grace that you show to me when I say something dumb weekly. When I do something dumb daily. Amen. Thanks. But the truth is it's also a joy to see people who go out of their way. And by the way, I don't assume you only go out of your way here. So many of you serve in the community and go out of your way to be a blessing to others. It is a blessing and a joy for me. And I will tell you, I will. Because somebody last week said something to me. How much longer are you going to do this? As long as I have breath, as long as, as long as God calls me to keep teaching, I hope that when I'm 78 years old that I'm still standing, well, in our bigger building that we have to build. <laughs> Somebody asked me this week, they said, why don't we just expand our building? I said, you can make a donation today and um, <laughs> I said, it's cheaper to add a service. So we'll add a service for now. But it means that some of you will have to go out of your way. Some of you will have to make room. Some of you will have to serve as deacons. Some of you will have to greet people at the door. Some of you will have to help with donuts. Some of you will have to help with the kids' ministry. Some of you will have to help with the sound. Some of you will have to help with the video that pre presents. You can't just sit if we're going to reach new people. So find a place to serve. And why should you serve? Because by serving, you make room for others. Years ago, there were a couple of young boys who came to see a revival preacher. And they came to this tent meeting, and they walked in the back, and the place was full. And so these two teenage boys said, well, let's go home. And they started to go home, and this deacon grabbed them real quick and said, hey, I got some seats for you guys. Now, one thing I know because of what happened next is I have a feeling that deacon had had a bad day. I have a feeling that on his way that night to this meeting, he said, you know what? They don't need you tonight. You know what? Aren't you tired? You should stay home. You know what? You shouldn't do what you're called to do. And here's why I know it mattered, because he got those young boys in the front, and both those boys gave their lives to Christ, and one of those boys had a name you might be familiar with. It was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham gave his life to Christ, and then he went and shared with tens of thousands of people who gave their lives to Christ, including one of our ladies Saturday night who came up to me last night after the service and said, I gave my life to Christ at a Billy Graham conference. Because of some deacon that we don't know the name of, who probably had a bad day, 
who I'm sure the enemy said, you need to quit because that's what the enemy does when we're making a difference. And today all these boxes are here because Billy Graham's son decided to do an outreach around the world where you can pack boxes and send the gospel and tell people about Jesus all over the world. And so you and I got to be a part of that, not just because of Franklin Graham, not just because of Billy Graham, but because of some guy at a tent revival who probably didn't think what he was doing matters that went and found a seat and made room for Billy Graham to sit down. That's all he did. And it's changed the course of history for so many of us in eternity for so many. These boxes may do the very same thing. Some kid may receive this box somewhere else in the world and it may change their life for eternity. They may come to Christ because of it. A lot of times kids take these boxes and they share it with their whole family. Did you know that? A little box that in America we would open and the kids would probably set aside and half the stuff we'd find in the floor of their room later that night. These kids will have this stuff for years and they'll get pamphlets about what it means to know Jesus. And so we're going to pray together for each of these boxes. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we pray as these boxes go around the world, we're, number one, we're thankful for all the hands that packed them, that gave their time, that sacrificed their energy to make things and to put these things together and to get them all together. And Lord, we pray as these boxes go around the world that your love would be evident in every single package. Lord, we ask that every child that receives one of these boxes would come to know you. We pray they would know your love, that they'd be able to share that love with their families. Lord, that your love would go around the world. We thank you for the small part that we've had in that. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to encourage you today, if you didn't hear anything else, I know life, it's easy to get discouraged. On a weekend like this when we celebrate, I want to encourage you, think about what you have to be grateful for and thankful for. And then be watchful. Ask God to help you to be watchful for how he can use you. And when he puts it on your heart, don't say no. Say, God, whatever you want me to do. And if you're here today and you're like, I want to quit. I don't want to do it anymore. It's too hard. It's too much work. I just want you to remember that deacon that sat Billy Graham. I promise you he had a bad day. Probably got a flat tire on the way to the thing. Because that's just how life is. And yet, God will use you. So don't let the enemy talk you out of being faithful. Just keep going. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can, I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you're here today and you've been discouraged, ask God, God, would you refocus my heart, refocus my mind? Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. Lord, bless each one. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of offering now.